Yes. Good morning or good day, whatever time of day you're watching us. Uh, happy Let's Talk About It Tuesday. I'm Georgia. I'm the mom. And I'm TJ. I'm the son. And we both study and work in the field of psychology, and we are passionate about sharing what we know with you so that you can live your best life. So today we're going to talk about group mentality. Mm. Right? Group think. Yes. Uh, so groups, two or more people who define themselves as a group, uh, recognized by at least one other person as a group, can be formal or informal. Uh, the two main types are referred to as common bond, where they're formed based on an attachment to each other, like almost like a family type mm -hmm. bond. Um, and then common identity, where they are formed based on their attachment to the group's identity, how they define themselves, right? Um, one of the big factors that are typically talked about when we talk about groups is cohesiveness. Um, those things that bring that group closer together. Uh, small size is something that tends to make a group more cohesive. How similar group members are and then threats from an outside group. And that last one, every time I, I say that out loud, I, I think of you kids growing up and you know, as a mom, you always want your kids to be super close but they all have their own unique identities and so they don't seem like they're that close but i tell you what when one somebody else comes in and threatens threatened one of you the other two are like uh, there you know like you got to see how that threat actually rekindled or strengthened your your bond so that was always cool it didn't happen a lot but i saw it a few times and i just thought wow that's kind of cool yeah and that group group cohesiveness is something that each additional member that you get each one of those factors gets harder and harder to maintain, right? So obviously the smaller size, the more it can be cohesive. Similarity between the group members, the more you have different group members, the more there's going to be a lack of similarity. More likely there's going to be more than one threat because there's more targets. So group cohesiveness, like many people can probably see in their job, just the more uh, kind of lines of communication, a lot more things can get kind of miscued. And so just make sure you're kind of taking that into consideration. That's a great point. Uh, group membership does not have to be formal. You know, I don't have to officially belong to a crochet club, but I can identify with people who like to crochet. You know, we have that thing in common. So a lot of times these groups that we're in um, are, you know, really based on our own perception of how we identify or bond with other people. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, one of the things that occurs with groups is, um, ethnocentricity. It's viewing um, the world from your own perspective and judging others in terms of your group membership. Mm. So, and this can be, this can be a good thing. Um, it's actually something that encourages solidarity in a group, cooperation, support, belonging, stimulates that group spirit. It can be a really great thing. But it all can be, also can be kind of dangerous because it can create divides. Um, it can create boundaries and it can actually prevent like prejudices from other groups. Um, it prevents people from maybe joining other groups. They feel like they have to be part of this group. Yeah. Um, it's that whole in-group versus out-group mentality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, and that, that kind of leads me to what I really would like to talk about. The fact that, you know, I talk about being in a crochet club, an unofficial crochet club member. That doesn't make me anti-knitting. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't have to be anti-knitting just because I, I love to crochet. Yeah, you don't have to automatically assume or put people in groups because that's a mental distortion that we all have from the subconscious just to put people in, label them into certain types of groups just to identify that, yeah, even though one's liking one doesn't mean that they're not liking something else. Just because one is pro something doesn't mean they're anti something else. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I had a student once who walked in to class with their shirt that said virginity rocks and I thought, well, it's kind of brave, but kind of cool. And I said, oh, neat shirt. He's like, yeah, I don't wear it a lot. And he said, well, why is that? He's like, because I get a lot of heat from people uh, when I wear it. And it's, you know, I think it's people projecting, you know, their own feelings of, um, I don't know, regret, or maybe they went in the wrong direction and automatically thinking, well, if he's pro virginity and I'm not a virgin, that means he must be anti me. That's not at all what it says. He's have, he has a viewpoint. He's happy about it. He's, you know, putting the message out there that maybe somebody else, it's okay for you too, if it's okay for me. But we automatically go to the, well, if he's not my group, 
then he's, he must not be, you know, we can't be together. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no. Yeah. Survival of the fittest, yeah. right? Like if they don't identify with my group, that must mean in some level that they are against mine. So just keep in mind, you know, identify what groups do you feel like you belong with? Right. And identify what maybe some of the opposite of those may be and go in and actually see some of their points, try to go in there uh, with, uh, a lack of emotion, so to speak, because oftentimes it's that emotion that's continuously building up these walls, which we're making it harder and harder. We think that we're fighting with these people. We're really just fighting with these own walls in our mind. So keep in mind, once again, what are the groupings that I'm either automatically setting myself up for? What are the groups that I'm already kind of putting myself in? And is that stopping me? Because science says the more that you are involved in a group, the more likely you are to get more so losing the idea or the purpose behind why you join that group to begin with right now it's just kind of habitual and you kind of go through it so constantly challenging constantly taking in new information because that's another thing that we tend to do as far as groups is just stop when we're in the group we have to keep on growing and keep on building instead of getting safe because we feel a lot of safety intrinsically automatically just from the, we love interpersonal relationships as humans so just keep in mind that there's more than one way to do it and then you have to cognitively uh, kind of di um, utilize some skills there because once again, Virginia rocks, it just depends on what you're looking at, right? If you could really identify with the fact that he's doing this in order to help other people and to make them feel, you know, insecure about it. it's not to attack these people, so on and so forth. But once again, unless you're taking the time that going through it yourself and not being stopped by some of those emotional barriers, the better you're going to be. So once again, just awareness of your groups, right? So when you when you run across somebody who's supportive of a group that you're not part of, um, you know, keep an open mind. There is a really neat site I found. It's called Living Room Conversations, and it's basically a format that allows you to have some conversations with people with different viewpoints in a safe. Um, and comfortable way um, because we really want to learn more about other people's viewpoints. You have to ask yourself, you know, why is it I'm threatened by another group? You know, why? Is it because you don't feel like you're that strong in your own? Is it that, are you on that such shaky ground that you are threatened by another group? So you need to be open because that knowledge is gonna help you relate to people, may even further your stance in your original group, but having those conversations are healthy and they're important. Um, and with those conversations, you see that a lot of those threats are more so just being created in your head or just expanded, like the threat is so much bigger than it really is. Mm -hmm. And the idea of this whole living room conversation is this is the environment, this is the setting that you need to be in in order to make any type of change or as far as groups or to prove your point successfully, mm -hmm. right? Because we all know how hard it is to change ourselves. Once again, I work as a clinical group psychologist and or therapist, I should say, or whatever word you want to put. And they pay for me and for my staff to, you know, change them and get them closer to their goals. And even that takes six weeks and then taper out a period of six months. And so it takes a long time. So when you're getting into some of these arguments, right, you think that you're just trying to be right to be right to be right. But in reality, you're pushing that person further and further away. So you have to make it like that of a living room conversation. Because once again, when you give empathy, understanding, and then you really try to actually talk about the root of it, that's what actually causes change, not just, you know, getting into an argument on social media or just commenting because right. you're not going to get that conversation. It's going to change. No one's going to win. You guys are going to sacrifice your own mental health. So you have to find what's in productive ways to expand your group's, um, you know, kind of security, mm -hmm. but then also understanding and better thought process towards behaviors. Right. Some of the so structures or some of the highlights they have at this website is be curious and listen to understand not listen to respond, right? Right. Um, show respect and suspend judgment. Yeah, you always have to, and once again, it's easier when you're actually in the profession, but you, you can't you can't do any time, you can't judge in any way. You have to show everybody unconditional respect, unconditional love, right? Because for a lot of these people that are in all alternative groups, or maybe once again, maybe we've kind of made it a much bigger deal than it really is. For a lot of it, it's just, it's, it's the same type of manifestation through emotion, or the same type of, you know, core and emotions and belief and connective and safety, but it's just manifested a little bit differently. So we're all, we're all so incredibly similar. It's just sometimes the manif manifestations are a little bit different. So once again, you have to, you have to give in order to take, right? And people are just trying to take from group, but it's, you have to, in order to, to grow, you have to do some of these things. 
That, that similarity that you just talked about, that's an important point. Um, we, you need to note those common ground, not just our differences. If we focus on what brings us together than what divides us, um, I think we'll be far more successful. Be authentic and welcome that from other people. Mm -hmm. That's an important point. Be purposeful and to the point and own and guide the conversation. Mm -hmm. So those are just some strategies that when we're, we're talking to people who uh, are in what we would call an out group, because they're not in our group, um, those are things that you need to keep in mind. Um, there's some interesting things about groups and their effect on both performance and decision making. Um, in terms of performance, one thing that I always think is interesting is um, when you have others around you and you're doing a task, it becomes easier with mm -hmm. those others around you. But when you have a task that's difficult and you have those people around you, it's harder. Mm -hmm. It's that much harder. So it just kind of exaggerates one or the other. Um, so I think that's kind of a neat thing. And I've, I've actually seen this. You know, I sometimes I have colleagues come in and, and watch my class. And when I first started teaching, um, that was scary. And it made my task that much more difficult. Um, but now, as I, cause I've been teaching for a while, somebody comes in. I'm like a jet. I'm like, all right, here we go. You know, and my, my performance is that's elevated. So that's kind of fun. Um, some effects regarding uh, decision making. Uh, there's a thing called group polarization that happens with groups, and that's the exaggeration of your initial attitude. So if initially you were cautious and, and now your group is cautious, you're going to be that much more cautious. If initially, you know, you're a risk taker um, and the group happens to be in that way, you're going to be even riskier. So it exaggerates your, um, your attitudes, your initial attitudes one way or the other polarization. The other thing TJ mentioned earlier, group think uh, is something that can happen with groups too. And that is uh, basically when there's a deterioration in your mental efficiency, reality testing, and moral judgment that results from in-group pressures. Um, so, and that's impacted by cohesiveness again, um, the group norms that you have. And if your group is either under pressure or facing a threat or bias in a particular direction, you might have more of that group thing going on. Yeah. Well, you have, you have, I mean, 50, 50 to 70,000 thoughts in the day, right? The likelihood of around 75 to 80% of those being subconscious outside of awareness are very likely. So if you're surrounded by these emotions that we were talking about, if you're surrounded by these ideas, even though you may not necessarily agree with all of them, you are going to have a much more increased chance of automatically uh, accepting them as some level, some level of safety from a subconscious standpoint. So it will continue to grow it. So once again, identify the emotions being felt, the thoughts being felt, and then more so yours, then more so something that is just kind of a byproduct of being along to different groups. Cause that's another normal thing is we all, we all identify with a bunch of different groups and, and things like that. But once again, identifying that there really is no group that we are all one group and identifying what are some ways to expand that. Cause that should be the goal of all groups is to identify that we're all kind of in the same boat. Right. All right. So this week, uh, we want to agree to disagree. We want to also agree, though, to listen, you talk about respect. Me. Oh, you want to talk about any of that? Oh, well, yeah, the okay. individual. Yeah, that's, that's some stuff. Can you Sorry. say that stuff? Okay. <laughs> You're missing. Yeah. Well, one of the things that also happens with groups is uh, something called de-individuation, which basically means that there's a reduced state of individuality. You feel less like an individual and you more as a, a group. And so like if you were to do something maybe inappropriate, well, it's the group. It wasn't me. It was the group. So kind of redirecting that. Um, and so that's something that I think it's important to be aware of. You still have a sense of responsibility, even as a group member. If you can't do stuff by yourself, it is because you have gotten to the point of the individualization. You don't necessarily know what to or don't like being around you or what have you. But if you don't like doing things by yourself, then that is a perfect example of this, a lack of an identity because of all of these little factions that we think that we're involved with. So keep in mind, once again, socially, that that it plays a big factor in it. I can't believe you're trying to skip over this. Keep going down. <laughs> no, seriously, I can't believe you're skipping over this. This is crazy. 
<laughs> keeps talking. Social roles is um, basically associated with uh, your state in a particular position. You know, anytime you're in any kind of environment, there are norms associated with it, and we have roles associated with it as well. As an instructor, there are certain expectations of me. I'm going to be in the front of the class. I'm going to be standing up. I'm going to be walking around, and I'm going to be facilitating the discussion. Those are uh, norms associated with my social role, um, and they can affect our, our behavior um, in sometimes um, damaging ways. Um, the other thing that um, is impacted by uh, groups is social influence and the level of social influence. So conformity becomes a big, big factor because we have an incredible need to connect and belong to groups and we will do what it takes to conform to stay in those groups, to stay in, you know, the uh, the other people's expectations of us. That's why I go back early to being, being genuine, genuinely authentic, mm -hmm. um, surrendering your outcome and doing the hard work, right? So the doing the hard work is agreeing that, or identifying that you are not going to identify or agree with everybody's opinion in that group. Um, so that obviously doing the hard work, surrendering the outcome, don't let the group you try to peer pressure, you do any of these things, they're going to respond how they're going to respond. It's more a reflection of them. And then once again, just be, all versions of yourself, which for some of us, we have completely lost sight of the individual person because of all of this kind of almost automatic placing of groups that we have in our heads, these walls, break them down. You're a lot more individualized than any of the groups that you're in. And it is time for you to identify that because that is a big reason why you're not getting forward because you're losing that individualism because of all these different groups. So once again, what do you really want? Right. The other two levels of social influence, and we actually have a podcast specifically on social influences, uh, so, uh, compliance, which is basically when you agree to do things that somebody requests of you, and then obedience, where it's similar, but you're requested by somebody who has authority over you. Yeah, so. get your hand out of the way. Hold on, you, um, what else did you skip? I didn't skip anything. How that dare was you? It. How dare you? <laughs> that was such a good one, too. I can't believe that. Um, okay. Yeah. You, you pass. I'm in trouble. <laughs> no, you pass. Reducing prejudice? Do we have a self I didn't strategy? talk about reducing prejudice. Um, be, well, I did, but I just didn't call it that. So I had Increasing mentioned earlier contact that- contact between the target of stereotyping and the holder of the stereotype, making values and norms against prejudice more conspicuous, providing information about the targets of stereotyping. Yeah. So ethnocentricity can lead to prejudice. And those three things that TJ just mentioned are uh, actually specific strategies. And we did address them, but just I didn't identify them as being addressed. Basically, you want to be in Formed. You want to understand people and their viewpoints, and that will automatically uh, reduce prejudice. It's, it's about understanding. It's about finding common ground. So Your brain automatically puts you into groups. Your brain automatically builds up walls towards people that do not provide the safety. In your group, you have to consciously challenge them. You have to consciously find the things that make you generally authentic because a lot of, our, a lot of us are losing ourselves in this. Find yourself. All right. So... This week, we want you to agree to disagree, but also agree to listen, respect, learn, and find common ground. And be the mature one, because <laughs> arguing with a fool proves that there are two. You have got to identify the boundaries, identify what some of these common grounds can be. And a lot of these, you just have to prep yourself up and hype yourself up before the situation arises or occurs, because we're all we're all in the same boat. We are. We're all trying to do the same thing. Same thing, find different that manifestations. If you talk to anybody long enough, right? Yeah. Um, it, yeah. <laughs> have a great week. We'll see you next week on Let's Talk About It Tuesday. Get out of my face. <laughs>